Welcome, listeners, to another episode of Speaking Truth to Goodness, where we seek joy and purpose on our burning planet. I'm Patty Robron, joined by my delightful co-hosts, Jerry Atkin and Michaela McCormick. Today, we're venturing into the realms of degrowth and the transformative power of science fiction, guided by the visionary works of Ursula Le Guin. We're examining how embracing change expanding activism, and dreaming of new futures can activate us in the present. This episode is a rallying cry for all of us to reconsider what activism means and to find new effective ways to get in the way of a system that needs changing. So buckle up as we explore these concepts and discuss how we can collectively mobilize for a future worth fighting for. Remember to like, comment, subscribe, and follow us on Instagram to share your thoughts and join the movement. In the last few nights, uh, National Public Radio um, on a program called uh, The Day Explained. Have you ever heard of that? Mm -hmm. It comes on at 6 o'clock here in Portland. They did a series, uh, I think it was four nights in the, in the last week, on uh, capitalism and uh, doubts and criticisms of capitalism. Great. And the last session was on degrowth specifically. And one of the things that they uh, quoted was a statistic that um, more than half of the people in this country between the ages of 19 and 44 think that capitalism does more harm than good. Huh. So there's there's a ready audience out there. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure they are talking about it. They're not waiting for anybody else to, you know. Um, so, you know, we. I think you mentioned a few minutes ago, Jerry, that, that you know, these... There's no place for these conversations to happen, but in fact, they're happening all over the place in, in smaller groups of people. But it's not taking hold um, because I don't think we as a, as a populist, I'm speaking we now of, of uh, mainstream America, think that it's possible to get beyond capitalism. I mentioned yeah. this idea of degrowth to my brother on the phone. He's two and a half years older than me. He ran his own small business for many years. He listened to Rush Limbaugh for 20 <laughs> years. He's since reformed, but yes, <laughs> in recovery. But when I, I told him, you know, I'm, I'm in this group, that where we're studying degrowth and trying to figure out how to make use of that in terms of making change. And I said, he said, well, what is, what's degrowth mean? And he said, well, it's about producing and consuming less as collectively, you know, so that we don't ruin the earth and our relationships in, in total. And his response was, good luck with that. Oh. Yeah. It wasn't that he was disagreeing. He was right. just saying, I don't think that's possible, Michaela. Give it up. Yeah. Oh my gosh, yeah. Michaela, I think you're hitting on something so important. It's the belief, not the sentiment that's the problem. Say more. What's, what distinction you're making there? Uh, yeah, good call. Because um, what you're saying makes it really clear that people are in on this. Like People understand yeah. we're not in a good place. This isn't good for us. And yet... The sense, like, probably everyone thinks, well, I'm, maybe I'm the only one who can really see it like that. You know, maybe people don't realize everyone's looking at it and being like, well, this is some bullshit. How could we change this? And, uh, but everyone thinks, well, don't say that out loud. Right. What was the thing, Jerry, a few months ago that I came across and shared with you? This was not my words, but it was, um, why is it easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism? Yeah. I mean, holy fuck. Right. It's, uh, it's, <laughs> it's so, true. I, I'm not sure, but I think I just read you some poems from Paul Goodman. I think he also wrote a book called Like a Conquered Province, <clears throat> talking about the psychology of America. Oh. 
and it's like we're a conquered, like Vichy France, you know, and and it's true. I mean, the level of disempowerment at the individual level. Oh, I use another big word, disempowerment. Uh, <laughs> the fact that people feel powerless. That's better. Um, I don't have any idea beyond one-on-one -on -one connection, which is increasingly rare, to help people realize that we do have power. I mean, John Trudell would say, they have authority, we have power. Because mm -hmm. our power comes from the earth. Our power comes from, you know, life itself. And I don't know, I just, I, Harriet Tubman, Said we we set a people free one soul at a time, and I can't I can't get past that I can't I don't know how people can change they need in my it, I believe that they need support to change, and I'm in an environment which feels like a conquered province you can't be the only one standing up, so I guess maybe our role at some level in the, maybe the cohort that we are part of, abstract word, um, is to empower people to resist and to believe in their capacity to resist, not by yelling at them, not by doing doomsday stuff, you know how that goes. Uh, yeah. Um, now, as a person with limited mobility, how the hell do I do that? I don't know. But I know I, know I do it. I know I actually do it everywhere I go. Mm. But I'm not everywhere. Yeah. Well, I'm here, and, even, and here it's like. So I just feel like there's so much that this one conversation sets us so many tasks in our in changing our way of understanding what we're doing. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like stunning to me mm -hmm. as a 83 year old person. Mm -hmm. And I had already begun to accept, based on my experience with this younger generation, that it's a new world. That it's, that it's not this world in a different stage, or maybe, it, but, but it definitely is a different world. Uh -huh. And how, and, and if I look at, if you look at your childhood, your childhood, my childhood, they bear no relationship to what's going on now. So our learning curve needs to accelerate. We need to understand that better. And Adaptability. That's the word that keeps hitting my brain with yeah. everything you're saying. You <laughs> but know, that... I, go on. Okay, I was going to say, because adaptability is a, a big word in my head. Okay, it's probably another one of those abstract words. It's okay. Ish. Not all ones are bad. This is intersectionality. <laughs> <laughs> intersectionality. I'll get Jerry real that? riled up. Um, <laughs> but adaptability, and this is a thing I think about in terms of the climate itself, too, <clears throat> right? Like, we need to have food production systems that aren't vulnerable to extreme weather, you know? Like, so we need to have systems in place that can deal with what's coming, with the chaos that's coming. And so that... <sighs> Right? Like the idea of, of having backup plans and being adaptable is probably the biggest one in my head as far as where we're going from here. Mm -hmm. So I think that that idea of we're going to work together with all the right people and build this huge cohesive plan that's got steps and sub steps and partners at each step and all of that, I think that's gone. Because I think by the time you get a plan built, yeah. It, the result, like, yeah. it, it's moved, right? Yeah, like, exactly. things have moved on. Yeah. So I think this is where it's more of a, well, we know in general this is what we want. <laughs> What's the next thing right now we see that leans that direction? You know what I'm saying? Uh, it just isn't, it isn't, uh, yeah, we just can't, like, control it so much anymore. We have to be instruments in the movement more than drivers of the movement. Yeah. Is that a weird way to say that? Yes, but it's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> because, well, so here, uh, to be weird about it, I guess, I always think about how we know that corporations and our institutions are, are messing us up. They're, they're unhealthy for us. They, they don't take the human component into account. 
and it ends up like we're subservient to our mm -hmm. institutions and our corporations, like they're our new, uh -huh. you know, pantheon. Um, <laughs> okay, let me get my head on straight about that. So we end up being subservient to it, yet we were the ones that made it. And so it's that, it's that empowerment, being able to understand, you no, know, we make up these systems we can remake the systems, uh -huh. but that that like desire, that conservative to desire to hang on to, we're going to do it this way because we've always done it that way, mm -hmm. was a great idea when we were, you know, learning how to chip flakes off of a stone and teach the next generation how to make a, a good tool. And then, but we at that point we would have expected them to then take that tool and make it better. And at some point, we ended up with a couple of generations, I think, who were like, well, we've got it all figured out, so now you just need to do it the way we've done it, yeah. in perpetuity. Mm. Well, that's the TINA, T-I-N-A, there is no alternative. Mm. So that's, that's the argument, there is no alternative to capitalism. Socialism doesn't oh, work, yeah. communism doesn't work. Well, capitalism doesn't work either, mm. so <laughs> you know, where do we go to that? It, do it doesn't. But it's not as if we did it, it's we allowed it to be done. That's the like a conquered province thing. We became completely passive. Um, I don't exactly know how that happened. Well, because it worked for a while or it, it, it met the needs of a lot of us for a long time. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that was easy to, to just give into and say, oh, good, we've got it solved. We don't have to think about it anymore. We just have to follow the rules and play the game. Uh, I just finished reading uh, Ursula Le Guin's 1975 uh, novel, The Dispossessed. Have you, oh. either of you read that ever? Yes, well, of course. Hasn't everyone? <laughs> well, I hadn't, only 900 I hadn't pages. read it before. Uh, it's a fucking amazing. It it is. It's, it is. it's the story. It's the story of a, a protagonist, a, a math a physicist, who lives on a planet that was settled by people who um, were allowed to um, migrate from their home planet that looks very much like the Earth. Mm-hmm. Uh, because uh, they were anarchist, philosophical anarchists. Well, but activists as well. And and instead of uh, trying to kill them or jail them all, the people in power sent them away. Al allowed them to to leave, and they created their own egalitarian, compassionate, uh, but much less brilliant culture and society on this new planet that was boring in a lot of ways. But people considered each other, everybody, their brothers and sisters. And the purpose of their society was to make sure that everybody's needs were met. He developed this uh, theory of what he called simultaneity which is based in part on the theory of relativity. Uh, and he was trying to, to sell it to his own people on, on his own adopted planet. And they weren't buying it. And he couldn't figure that out because this was supposed to be this open, democratic, uh, ever-searching, learning culture, you know. And he finally gave up and got after a lot of struggle, permission to go back and visit the old planet where capitalism was king right. and competition was the order of the day. And they were interested <laughs> for, uh, the, for their own selfish reasons in his theory. And it turned out that, that uh, there were plenty of people suppressed in, in this old world who uh, were inheritors of 
those who migrated to this new planet, they were anarchists as well. But of course, they didn't have any power. But he, uh, after finding out that that the people in power were just using him and wanting to to uh, own his theory for their own technological advancement, he sought out these people, and um, they created a a fuss, and uh, of course that movement got put down. But he got back to his home planet and through all of that realized that uh, neither the capitalist planet or his own socialistic, quote unquote, democratic, egalitarian could not get stuck in any one particular philosophy or way of doing things, that the, gen- the primary rule of any society should be faith in change. <laughs> and that if we stay committed to change, we'll be able to keep making decisions in the right direction so everybody's needs get met. Yeah. I feel like dancing about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right. And so that's part of what, you know, what I heard from my brother the other day when I was t- talking to him about the growth was he wasn't prepared to consider change. He thought we're stuck here and we just yeah. have to accept what is. And everybody I've mentioned, most, not everybody, most of the people I've mentioned the word degrowth to are pretty much in the same way. Good luck with that, Michaela, trying to get us to consume and produce less. Ain't gonna happen. Well, yeah, we are gonna produce less <laughs> as the crisis deepens. Yeah, they yeah. may change their minds about that. Right. Well, so you're reminding me of a phrase that's a favorite in our house. Uh, Heraclitus said, "Change is the only constant." Yeah. Yeah. That's a that is a big idea. Wow. Well, my friend Terry had this poster along with all of the anti-slavery posters. Um, we have to change to survive, but we have to survive to change. Mm. So I think that that reality is written into this scenario that we're facing. Mm-hmm. We have we have to survive in order to create a better world. Mm-hmm. We can't create a better world and not survive. That would kind of undermine the whole point of the thing. <laughs> Defeat it? the purpose yeah. a bit, yeah. We could go down in flames. <laughs> And victory, be spiritual. And- <laughs> but we don't have to survive in the same form with the same kind of civilization that we've created up to this point. Yeah, we won't. And not all of us have to survive. It may be a small percentage of us. Yeah, well, who I survive. think that. Yeah, we should be all be reading dystopian novels to see you know, the best post-apocalyptic strategy. Um, I mean, the the fact that there has been a flurry of uh, post-apocalyptic or apocalyptic novels or book series over the mm. last 10 years is mm. maybe, I mean, maybe that's more than we realize the evidence that we understand. You know what I'm saying? Thank I you. think I was our... thinking about Octavia Butler. Mm, mm, I was just thinking of her. Oh. Do you know who Octavia Butler is? Mm-hmm. She was the stunning force in the science fiction world, African American woman, who who dealt with issues of survival and issues of change and became quite so there's a there is a um a book called um Parable of the Sower. Yes, but I was thinking of Octavia's children. There's a group of writers who think of themselves as being Inspired and brought into being by the force of Octavia uh, Butler. Yeah. Um, maybe I need to dig out, get my magnifying glass so I can read and read some Octavia Butler. But it's not easy stuff. No. At all. It's just, so it's interesting how science fiction, in some ways, is an arena in which ideas get hashed out mm-hmm. in contexts that many people discard and say science fiction is. It's not science, it's just fiction. That part's probably true, for the most part. But, um, 
Yeah, she was she was in the same um, mindset as Ursula Le Guin in that they their stories were prescient. They foretold oh, mm-hmm. a kind of civilizational development that we are now living. Yeah, um, I think Ursula's probably the greatest world builder ever mm-hmm. um, because her parents were... Her dad was probably the most famous cultural anthropologist of his generation. Mm-hmm. So she grew up in this environment that knew about cultural evolution, knew about... Mm. So she's actually informed in a way that it's you're let's just like your kids are growing up with a, a whole set of information and experiences that they then will take into the into their adult lives and um octavia butler carried forth uh le guin's ideas about uh being committed to change her story particularly in the in the novel the parable of the, of the, the sower, sower. Yeah. Uh, the protagonist is a young woman whose civilization is disintegrating uh, amidst uh, lots of violence and unmet needs and people dying. And she uh, is a um, hyper empath. Do you know what I mean by that? Tim? I absolutely do. She okay. she feels other people's pain to the point that it is can be physically debilitating right. to her so it's 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 a detriment but it also makes her incredibly empathic everybody yeah. and she develops on her own as an as a young woman as someone in their in their late teens a faith in change and understood that the way to live our lives is by being committed uh, to change and nimble enough to -hmm. keep adapting without trying to create some kind of Mm. value uh, construct that will get us stuck somewhere. Yeah, I had forgotten about, it's been a long time since I read Octavia. Ah, so interesting. You get the word of the day, Michaela, nimble. Um, yeah, light on our feet. Yeah. And, and, and that's, I mean, that's what I learned in dealing with my wife's dementia. You can't, you can't have expectations. You have to be able to understand what's happening in every moment. And if you bring expectations with you, you're going to miss it. So, um, so, that, so that's sort of a side out of this conversation, but it's, that the ideas are out there in places like Ursula and Octavia and God knows how many other amazing writers. <clears throat> I wasn't sure uh, if this would be a good time to bring up that article. Maybe not. It's that It was this article that I found by Michael R. Hicks. Um, he's part of the a- an ADOS community, American Descendants of Slavery. Um, and they're very focused on reparations as a as an organization. But so when I went looking for, because I, I know about this agile, like the idea that change is the constant in in a movement in developing a an app or whatever, right? Um, agile as a concept comes from the software development industry. From what? Software development. Hmm. So this is where you know seeing that corporations occasionally are understanding that they need to take care of the humans working for them and ways that we can find um, through things like Six Sigma, which is a it's a development process also, but it involves a lot of like reviewing what you've done and learning from your mistakes and things like that. So what mistakes. <laughs> See, we need to make mistakes. It's important. It's the most important thing toward change. Why do you change. think I'm laughing? I know, I, I know. I haven't made one yet today, but maybe. <laughs> yeah. But so, um, so this guy, Michael R. Hicks, makes a case for taking the, the quick churn of adaptability and learning and taking the next step that was developed for the software industry. And 
he's making a case for using it in activism, mm. which I thought was really fucking cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And well, is where we seem to be um, mm-hmm. circling around right now. <laughs> so, Senator, we're talking about, we, you mentioned early that you don't know whether to think of yourself as an activist or not. Yeah. Activist is also not a useful word right now. Activist has stigma in the community that we're trying to connect with. Right. Well, and I think last time you mentioned how I, and this is true, that I have a really strong feeling that that the, a movement, this movement, uh, the change of humans, isn't going to happen because of an activist situation. It's going to be because people calling themselves that understood how to engage more of the every man, every person. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. At least that's my sense about it. But I'll willingly say I don't know shit. So well, we no, need to expand just... the definition of activism. Because what, you you're, go. what you're pointing to, Patty, is, is activism as well. That's fair. Our attempts are... As activists, our attempts to understand the greater population is part of activism. Yeah. And it's not something that we do well yeah. yet. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we too, just like corporations, get stuck in what we've been doing for decades. Right. You know, so I've been going to protests and demonstrations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, for decades. Yeah. And the powers that be learned a long time ago how to ignore that, how to suppress that, how to water it down. Yep. And they're still doing it. It's still working. And and Extinction Rebellion is caught in that same place where we keep going out and, you know, with our signs and our noises and, you know, we do creative things like zany bits and other things. But it's not enough. It has not found a vulnerable spot in the powers that be to make a significant difference yet. Mm -hmm. And that's what we have to look for. And when I saw after George Floyd was murdered, I saw every other house just about everywhere in Portland pop up with a Black Lives Matter sign. And uh, when... You know, Trump was being all his Trumpiness, all of the in our America, love is love and all of those things popped up everywhere. I was like, okay, so at least in this city, we've got a pile of people who are ready and would do it. You know, maybe some of them are doing it because like five other houses on the street have that sign. And so, gosh, I got to keep up with the Joneses and have one, too. But that's not everybody. There's a whole lot of people are like, I care about that. And maybe that's all they can do is put a sign in the front. But I think we can use people's willingness even to do that to get enough people on our side about Zenith that we can make the city council shake in their boots. And that's what I want to do. And that was part of why I got into Extinction Rebellion is because I saw what Extinction Rebellion was doing in the UK and it was colorful. And they had thousands of people in the street doing the colorful thing. I was like, yeah, I like that. I don't feel like I have to lead something like that. Or I don't even feel like we here in Portland have to do exactly that. But the idea of getting all the regular people involved, even to do a token of like to say, hey, I stand for this or hey, I stand against this. If we've got it right, we're going to make leaders scared. And that's what we need to do because corporations want to make money. So they don't like it when we get in the way of that. Leaders want to get elected again. They don't like it when we get in the way of that. Well, good. Let's be annoying as hell and get in the way of those things. (laughs) Right? And if you're saying 50% of people get it, they realize capitalism is killing us. Well, great. Yeah. It's like that article that I shared on the XRPDX uh, active list last week, you know, about stop fossil fuels. You know, they, what they think they're learning is that... Oh, you mean, you mean just stop oil? I'm sorry, just stop oil. Yeah. Yeah. Um, What they think they're doing is is, um, creating discomfort among 
the, their targets, the fossil fuel corporations, but also the general populace. And we as um, white Americans in particular, even activists, are largely uncomfortable with doing that. We want to be liked. We want to be recognized for our moral uh, position, our superiority. You know, we don't want to be called troublemakers. You know, but uh, <laughs> there's, a, uh, there's a great song from the '60s about that. I just. I'll find it. I just mm. can't see the, mm. can't see the, But it's like, it isn't nice to, is the, so the lyric is, it isn't nice to block the doorways, it isn't nice to go to jail, but the nice ways mm -hmm. don't work. Um, right. And so what's missing, I keep coming back to this like a conquered province. In the 60s and 70s, it was actually not a huge proportion of the population, but there were people who were and there was support. There was a counterculture, whatever you want to call it. So there was a place. And then, again, the civil rights movement in the South created this updraft of energy that other people could draft behind. Bicycle thing here. But, um, I wish I can't ride. Um, that's not here. In other words, there's no wind at our back here when we, when we stand up. Um, so... I can now, I'm going to rethink activism if we think about it as act, not as taking action, but as activating people. Ooh. Yeah. That's good. We could just good. switch yeah. it around there because that's what needs to happen. Uh -huh. You know, and I think, I think there was, I mean, you know, Lorraine's at the center of pretty much anything good that's happening. You know, they did actually go to a couple of neighborhood associations to talk about Zenith. Yeah. That's where we need to go. Yeah. You know, in front of the bank, not so much. Neighborhood Association supporting the youth climate strike, which we do, but we should do more. Or what am I talking about? I don't have any idea what we do because I'm just peripherally connected. I'm like a limpet on this organization. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Stationary and I don't know what limpets do, but... Um. Researchers who have studied uh, the effectiveness of... Uh, Nonviolent direct action movements uh, pretty much agree now that it only takes about 3.5% of any population uh, to become actively involved in the movement. Now, they don't define actively, but yeah. you know, I think that's where we are in our conversation. Um, oh, we have to, to have significant change mm -hmm. in that society, you know. So yeah. It's, and it's not just putting a sign in your yard, you know. It's, it's doing things. So, so I just want to look back at that and what happened. And it's, it's tragic, but Trump orchestrated a level of violence mm. that broke that movement. So t tens of thousands of people came into the street and then got scared and went back home. Mm. Um, it takes 3.5% of the population to get scared and, and take the pressure off. And then, as, again, the, the royal we as white people, um, well, hell, I mean, that was fun, and, why, you know, why, why do we have to suffer? Why do we have... No, I don't want to do that. So it's... And, and it's, I see it everywhere. It's the... People like the idea... But they don't like understanding that for that to happen, they need to do something. And I just feel, uh, Larry Kleiman is one of the founders of the Farm Workers, said, you know, s some people are on loan to the movement for five years. Um, oh, it takes us back to the conversation of racism. I can decide whether or not to engage racism on any particular day. Uh -huh. uh, BIPOC folks don't have that option. They have to do it every day. We're so shallow on our understanding. And, and I hate to say it, I mean, I, what do I know? But it's like my experience tells me that without any direct experience with people who've experienced oppression at the hands of the system greater than what we've experienced, which is much more mental than it is physical, mm -hmm. it's like these are different worlds. These are different worlds. 
So that takes us back to sort of the earlier part of the discussion. It's like, and I think, I think I have some experience in doing this, and that is we need to be able to just be present and learn from the experiences that we share if we're in the street or we don't share. But there has to be that cultural humility, that recognition that the way things have evolved has given white people an inordinate amount of power over everybody else. Mm -hmm. Other people can come in, but it's still the white power structure that they are joining. That won't work. That won't make change. So we have to... So I just think it's, okay, the journey of a thousand miles, we used to say, begins with a single step. Listening is perhaps the, the first step. But to listen, we have to be present. Mm -hmm. So we have to go where we are welcome. Yeah. We have to, in a sense, show good faith. Um, where we might feel uncomfortable. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, I think I feel really lucky. Right now, outside of violence, almost nothing makes me uncomfortable. <laughs> I mean, it's like, it doesn't. I, and again, I go back to how much I've learned from the, uh, the young people in a short time, because I actually am there. I'm actually there, and I'm not making a judgment. I'm taking in and honoring so I think I am honored in return for honoring these wild animals, <laughs> animals living in the wild, and wild animals, not wild, wild animals. But don't you think if we're recognizing that there is change afoot, <laughs> should we want to keep moving forward in, a, in activist work? How, how far can we push that change? Because if people, you know, showed up in droves for the women's march in all of our pink pussy hats after Trump got elected, and yeah, since then, that. you know, George Floyd, and then enough trucks started barreling through um, groups of people in the street that maybe people have decided to stay in their houses, well, okay, that's where we're at. Yeah. Like, that's not great. But if that's where we're at, fine. It, they can't beat me. Let's figure out how we are together in our homes. Like, uh, <laughs> Steve and I have a little bit of a joke because we're introverts, very much so. And uh, it's something about, you know, introverts hanging out together separately in their homes. <laughs> I don't think I'm getting the joke quite right. But, you know, for, for introverted folks, that connection online actually is connection and i know you hate that and i totally know that but it, it i'm not saying it has to be online but if the fully in the street thing isn't how it's happening now yeah. we can show solidarity in other ways and maybe we have to think of what that would be like you know because we could hold as an ideal us all getting in the street and you know, marching right up to the to the Capitol building or something. I mean, that sounds awesome. It's it's the feeling of that that definitely yeah. drew me into activism type stuff. Like, oh, I love that. Like, fuck you guys hurting us. Like, here we come. Right? Like, that's big. But if we can't get the people to do it, right. what will they do? I, I'm I don't want to say all is lost. We can find a way. Yeah. So yeah. You know, it's so interesting. This conversation is miles wide um, and, I know. <laughs> and deep, and miles deep, too. Um, people, I, it's, the, to me, the difficult step is getting people to realize that the simple act of eating less meat, <laughs> turning off the lights, these little acts of self-preservation are important and not to be, and without them, if I think if people had the consciousness that made them change their behavior, they would be much more susceptible to being gathered in with other people. So part of this is somehow finding a way onto the social agenda with these simple things. I do some of them. I don't do a lot of them. 
I don't know why I don't do a lot of them. I must be a not good person because I should be doing a lot of them. Um, but I don't experience guilt about that. No, wait. <laughs> <laughs> but I just so I just feel like we're at ground zero. We're we are starting in a sense. We're always starting over. Since change is the only constant, we're mm-hmm. always at the beginning of whatever comes next. And I, I think, I think like, not in neighborhood associations that are part of the city structure are questionable because property owners generally dominate those. But Alder Commons, these community centers that pop up in neighborhoods, uh, we need to give them a ton of support mm-hmm. to support what they're doing. Um, it does seem like people who are engaged already in a neighborhood association or a local community right. center probably are maybe like that next tier of folks that would join the fray a little right. bit, right? Like maybe the ones that you could reach out to to, I don't know, letter writing campaign doesn't feel like the right thing either. But right, like if you have a thing that needs a lot of voices, so they clo- seem like the next close, level of close folks. your ears now. We have to retake the churches. We have to retake the churches. We have to make churches the moral force that they were during the civil rights movement. Predominantly black churches, but white churches as well. I told you to close your ears, Patty. <laughs> oh, but, I, I mean, I told you. I, I can okay. redesign a church building to a beautiful community center. No deity needed. You know me. Why did I... Why did, the use of explosives come to mind when you were talking about redesign. Oh uh, no, I need carpet paint. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, so good. <laughs> uh, so, but it's like commercial kitchen equipment. We need to find <laughs> if there is, if there is even a corrupt moral center and force, we need to uncorrupt it because though to me working with. Uh, really principled Catholic nuns in Africa and in the U.S., the Marianal Sisters. I mean, those those people have moral fiber and fervor waiting to be harnessed, and the church is suppressing it. Oh, my God, church institutions are horrible. That's my recent experience. Now that I'm going to a Bible study class, don't even ask. <laughs> <laughs> well, but how different is what you're saying from... My thought on, well, hey, Amazon has figured out how to move a lot of product really fast and really automatically. It's just where the people come in, they're expecting the people to fit into what is an otherwise technological and mechanical system, and that doesn't work. So I would much rather take the wins that Amazon has produced in terms of what we can do better for humans and fix the stuff that's broken, Right? Like, I'm not opposed to a church right. something existing. No, I know. Well, it's, it's a stretch. But you're right. It, it had a, a, a cohesive... Or it, it split it provi- churches. It split churches going back to the Civil War. I mean, this, there, there are different churches broke apart in that time and are still separate because of the issue of slavery. Oh, sure. Well, they they split apart off of... Way tinier doctrines well, yeah. than that. But that's, this one was very dramatic. Someone here is writing a book about it. That's why I think about it. Um, and the code word then was that, there, that people are coming from the north to the south to destroy our way of life, mm-hmm. not to end slavery. <laughs> so mm-hmm. there's always code words. And that's yeah. the other thing like about activists. The right has sort of, they're brilliant at distorting language. So you realize that's the same thing that is said about like yeah. immigrants coming to this country right. to destroy our way of life. Yeah, poison and poisoning. Uh, they're still saying it. Oh my god. Oh, okay. What, so where are we in this conversation? <laughs> well, I think you're mentioning uh, churches, Jerry. Made me think of uh, you know what's really valuable about <clears throat> people who consider themselves religious is not their religious doctrine but their belief in treating each other well and that's not limited to religious people that includes environmentalists and activists and all kinds of people people who who are part of neighborhood associations 
So I think, you know, rather than identifying a particular institution that we need to uh, appeal to, we need to identify the common values that they represent right. in terms of how we treat each other. Mm-hmm. And you don't have to believe in any particular dogma to do that. Right. Or even if you do, it doesn't mean the, that piece is part of it for you. When I went to my first Bible study class two weeks ago, three weeks ago, they said, oh, when was the last time you were in a Bible study class? I said, 1953. <laughs> so I'm not quite sure why I'm there, but I actually I do know it's because my friend has a moral fervor, which is not um, doctrinal, which is about... And when he, he is... A great teacher and and he comes alive and I, I love him and that's part of the reason I go but also a conversation about moral values is refreshing to me mm-hmm. you know? and I should say in this class I am one of the younger people because I'm only 83 and Dale at 81 is the youngest so these are people between 80 and 100 <laughs> who have moral uh, fervor uh, oh my god I love you uh, all and anyway, so so that's I mean, me in a Bible class is counterintuitive, but makes right. me it's making me think of uh, Mr. Rogers, Fred Rogers. Uh, he's quoted as talking about or talking like when he talked to kids, you know, when you see hard things going on in the world, to uh, to look for the helpers. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. and uh, so yeah, it maybe isn't about an institution. It's, it's the people it's who the, are in the There's helpers. Right? There are helpers and assholes everywhere. <laughs> and they're not assholes because they're assholes. I mean, they're assholes because they've been traumatized and hurt and broken <laughs> and not received any any a hand for yeah. healing. You know, I totally get that. So I am using assholes a little flippantly, maybe too flippantly, I realize. but Sphincter. Refer to them as sphincter. <laughs> what? <laughs> If I do it scientifically, does that make it better? Is that what you're saying? Orifices. Anus? Anus? Um, orifices. Or, or capitalism is guilty of anus crimes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, they are, though. I'm getting, I'm getting delirious again. Um, anus, anus, it's all the same. Exactly. <sighs> I love y'all. This is... That wraps up our exploration of degrowth, science fiction, and the endless possibilities for activism in our time. Inspired by the imagination of Ursula Le Guin and the inspiring work of Octavia Butler, we're reminded that change is not only inevitable, but necessary, and that our collective vision for the future can guide us toward meaningful action. As we close this episode, let's keep the conversation going challenging ourselves to think beyond traditional forms of protest and to embrace the discomfort that comes with true growth and change. Your engagement means the world to us, so don't hesitate to share your thoughts. Like, comment, and subscribe for more episodes, and follow us on Instagram to stay connected with our community. Here's to building a future together that honors all voices and fights for justice and equity. Until next time. Keep speaking truth to goodness, because goodness is all around.